Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for the creative and curious amongst you. Skillshare is a place for you to explore new and existing interests and skills taught by passionate people with real experience, from animation and photography to web development and graphic design. I first became interested in Skillshare after looking for ways to improve as a content creator. Their platform was easy and intuitive to use and I was able to find classes that covered all of my needs, like advanced video editing for Adobe Premiere Pro, taught by Geordie Vanderput, where I learned about shortcutting, masking, and fixing and enhancing audio. All these classes were split into easily digestible segments, and they gave me the knowledge I needed to grow my channel, engage with my audience, and create videos just like this one. The first 1,000 viewers to sign up through my link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Again, click that link in the description. Sign up and invest in yourself with Skillshare. This is the last known image of 22-year-old Christine Rush, captured on June 26th, 1989, as she went to withdraw some money from an ATM machine. Christine lived in Lenexa, Kansas, with her roommate, Teresa Brown. The pair were last seen at their apartment in the town's Trafalgar Square area on June 25th. The following day, Christine called up both Teresa's boss and her own, and told them that neither of them would be coming into work that day due to ill health. After making those phone calls, neither Christine nor Teresa were ever seen or heard from again. An investigation into their disappearances was quickly launched. Just two days later, on June 28th, a car belonging to a wanted man named Richard Grissom Jr. was discovered parked outside an apartment complex in Grandview. Inside his vehicle were items that belonged to both Christine and Teresa, such as their jewellery and credit cards, as well as a key to their apartment. A key to the apartment of another missing woman from the local area, Joan Butler, was also found inside. Grissom was quickly tracked down and arrested just over a week later on July 7th. A painter and decorator by trade, Grissom had master keys to numerous apartment buildings throughout Lenexa. He also had a history of violence, having committed his first murder at the age of just 16. Though none of their bodies have ever been discovered, Grissom stood trial for the murders of Christine, Teresa and Joan. He was found guilty in 1990 and was given four life sentences. He is also believed to be a prime suspect in at least two other slayings. Despite not being eligible for parole until 2095 and having nothing left to lose, Grissom has never told the police where he buried any of his victims. Which brings us to this picture of Christine, the last one of her ever taken, captured on a surveillance camera. At 10 p.m., on June 26th, she drove to an ATM in Belton, Missouri, and emptied the bank account of her roommate, Teresa. In this very moment, she was being held against her will by Grissom. Detectives believe that Teresa had already been killed by this point, and Christine herself would meet the same fate shortly after withdrawing the money for Grissom. Given the backstory, this black and white image of her face becomes extremely haunting. Dale Kerstetter worked as a maintenance man and security guard at Corning Glassworks in Bradford, Pennsylvania. He was last seen at 11pm on September 12, 1987, caught on CCTV walking with this man in a balaclava. That night, $250,000 worth of platinum piping was stolen from the plant, taken from the room that the masked man was leading Dale towards in this picture. Not long afterwards, the masked man exited the room alone, dragging with him a large black bag. Dale was never seen again, and to this day, his body has never been found. Looking at this image, it's easy to conclude that Dale looked directly into the camera as a plea for help, a way for him to communicate to whoever would see it later that his life was in danger. However, 
Some believe that he was actually in on the whole heist from the start, and looked into the camera as a way for him to say, got ya. You see, moments before this image was captured, Dale was seen talking very casually with the masked man in the back area of the glassworks, and didn't appear to be in any distress. In fact, he roamed freely around the complex, and wasn't constantly supervised by the masked figure. Those who think that the pair were actually accomplices believe Dale either escaped through an unmonitored exit, or was actually double-crossed and slain by his partner in crime, probably while they were bagging up the piping. Indeed, according to the Glassworks manager, quote, Whoever removed the platinum from the tank was extremely familiar with the plant. Everything in the plant. They knew exactly where to go. I think the fact that he did everything in front of the camera was once again just Dale Kerstetter saying to us, Look, hey, here I am. I'm taking your platinum, and there isn't a thing you can do about it. Dale certainly had a motive to take part in the heist. He was about $40,000 in debt, and had just taken a major pay cut due to cutbacks at the plant. That said, his family believe that his money problems were manageable and that he would never abandon his seven children and two grandchildren without so much as a goodbye phone call. What's more, when sniffer dogs were brought to the scene, they tracked Dale's scent to a glass furnace on the second floor, an area where Dale's usual rounds wouldn't have taken him. So, was Dale Kerstetter caught off guard by this unidentified perp and killed during a one-man robbery, then placed into a black bag along with the valuable pipes and dragged from the scene? Or was he in fact in cahoots with this masked figure, and either escaped to start a new life elsewhere, or was slain by his accomplice, and burned in the furnace, or bagged up? Was this glance at the camera braggadocio, or one last cry for help? Given how long ago this happened, we'll probably never know for sure. In December 2019, 56-year-old Adrian Menevo took his elderly mother, Felicity Loveday, on a three-day boat trip in Melbourne, Australia. But this wasn't a casual and relaxed trip on the ocean that one might expect. This was a ritual. Adrian had taken his mother out to Port Phillip Bay in an attempt to rid her of bad magic and cleanse her body of evil spirits. Both mother and son practiced Buddhist mysticism, and, according to a friend, Adrian himself was convinced that he was Christ reborn. Felicity had also been a worshipful master in the Co-Freemasons, an extremely secretive society that, reportedly, have very bizarre beliefs and practices. With Felicity's health on the decline, Adrian believed that the sea water would help to dissolve the evil magic within her and restore her to full health. As such, Adrian purchased this small boat which he registered and insured in his sister Christina's name. He also gave his sister all of his online passwords, banking information, and his last will and testament, in which he left his entire estate to her. Christina came to wish the pair of them bon voyage on December 11th, and took this photo of them preparing to set off on their three-day trip. When they didn't return, she reported them missing on the 14th. Their capsized boat was later found floating in the bay, along with their life jackets. To this day, neither Felicity nor Adrian's bodies have ever been found. It was quickly determined that the pair of them had set off with only half a tank of fuel, far too little for three days on the water. So, there are obviously a number of suspicious elements to that whole narrative. Why would Adrian purchase a small boat for a multi-day trip on the water? The boat itself was far from suitable for a long voyage, and what with there being no sleeping quarters or space to freely move around? Why did he leave everything to his sister Christina just before setting off? Why did Christina take this strange photo as they departed, and why wasn't she concerned about her frail mother spending three days and nights on the ocean? Why did the pair remove their life jackets, which they were clearly wearing in this picture? And why had Adrian Google-searched Sea Burial in the days before he and his mother disappeared? In response to those questions, several interesting theories have emerged online. The creepiest of which being that in this very picture, Felicity Loveday was already dead. 
Christina then took this photo as fake proof of life evidence to try and show that Felicity was still breathing when she and Adrian set off on their voyage. During the trip, Adrian then dumped Felicity overboard, and then ended his own life, leaving his entire estate to Christina. That, or he faked his demise, escaped in a smaller boat that he had purchased, and is now hiding out somewhere as we speak. By leaving everything to his sister, she'd be able to support him in secret, without him needing to set up his own bank account. To be clear, those are all just theories, and Christina herself has come forward and denied that her mother was already deceased in this photo, claiming that she was just taking a nap. As it stands though, the truth behind this bizarre picture remains a mystery. Whatever the case, this is the last time that either Adrian or Felicity were ever photographed. This is the iconic final image of Chinese guerrilla fighter Cheng Benhua, standing before her Imperial Japanese captors in April of 1938. A fearless and unbreakable woman, Cheng led a resistance movement against the Japanese forces in Nanking, who had just killed her fiancé a few months prior. In this moment, she was well aware that she was about to be executed, and had just been tortured and raped by several soldiers shortly before this photo was taken. Refusing to give her captors the satisfaction of seeing any trace of fear, she instead defiantly stared them directly in the eyes. Minutes after posing for this picture, Cheng was bayoneted to death by the very men sat laughing behind her. She was just 24 years old. Impressed by her strength of will, Koichi Yamashita, the commander of the Japanese unit, wrote her name and age on the back of this photo as not to forget her. The image finally surfaced in 1992, when a Japanese veteran who had worked with Yamashita gave it to a Chinese journalist. He had come into possession of it decades prior, and, in his old age, worked with Chinese academics to atone for his actions in World War II. The photo was widely circulated throughout China, and today, a statue of Cheng stands in Nanking, commemorating both her bravery and her spirit. Next up, a chilling image captured by an ATM security camera. On the night of November 1st, 2017, a 26-year-old man named Dylan Steve stopped at a cash machine in North Miami Beach. As Dylan was making his withdrawal, he didn't notice the hooded man in this image quickly sneaking up behind him from a dark back street. That man, later identified as 17-year-old Marcin Hill, had been lying in wait for somebody to use that Bank of America ATM. He approached Dylan with the intention of taking his money. Dressed in a Kill Batman hoodie, Marcin aimed a pistol at Dylan and demanded all of his cash. Dylan dropped the $260 that he had just taken out onto the ground, and Marcin bent down to take it. As he did, Dylan lunged at Marcin and tried to disarm him, but his plan backfired. Marcin fired a shot at point-blank range into Dylan's chest, before disappearing into the night. Still conscious and pumped with adrenaline, Dylan made his way over to his mother, Sandy, who was waiting for him in a van nearby, and who had witnessed the entire thing. But unfortunately for Dylan, his robber had also just become his killer. After approaching his mother, Dylan collapsed to the ground, and died shortly thereafter. It didn't take long for detectives to figure out that Marcin Hill was the one responsible for Dylan's death. The 17-year-old had a long criminal history, having first been arrested at the age of 10, and then 14 more times since. He was picked up just two days later in Lauderhill. After accepting a plea bargain, Marcin was found guilty of second-degree murder, and sentenced to 25 years behind bars, followed by 10 more years of probation. That sentence, though, has done little to satisfy Dylan's family. In his mother's words, quote, Marcin took my life when he took my son's. He's a menace to society. He's the devil. Marcin Hill is scheduled for release on October 30th, 2042. He'll be 42 years old.
and whether you're for it or against it. Singapore is one of a handful of highly developed countries that still makes use of capital punishment. Though it's common for prisons to offer their condemned inmates one final meal request, at Singapore's Changi Prison, they actually have another, much more unorthodox practice. A final photo shoot. In the lead up to their hanging, inmates are permitted to dress in whatever clothes they like and are then brought into a room and professionally photographed. This image is then printed out, framed, and presented as a final memento to the inmate's family, either shortly before or shortly after the sentence has been carried out. Some believe this practice to be a good thing, as it leaves the family with a final memory of their departed loved one. Others believe it to be cruel and inhumane, saying that the photos only serve as a painful reminder of their family member's fate. It was at one of these photo shoots that this image of Nagarentram Dharmalingam was taken, sporting his favourite clothes and a blank expression, fully aware that this would be his final ever picture. In 2010, Nagarentram had been sentenced to hang for bringing three teaspoons worth of heroin into the country, something he claimed he was forced to do. Independent medical experts examined Nagarentram and concluded that he was actually severely intellectually disabled and only had an IQ of 69. A widespread international campaign of support for the young man followed, which even included personal appeals from Stephen Fry and Richard Branson, directed at the nation's president and prime minister, urging them to spare Nagarentram's life. Despite that, the Singaporean government refused to reduce his sentence. For 13 years, Nagarentram spent most of his days in solitary confinement. That is, until just two months ago, when the 34-year-old was brought out to take this photo. Thereafter, he was led out to the gallows, and at first light, on April 27th, 2022, his life was cut short at the end of a rope. Throughout Singapore, there's actually widespread support for capital punishment, but given Nagarentram's circumstances, many of the practice's supporters were critical of this outcome. This photo shows 22-year-old Canadian Danielle Kendall on a hike up the Cotopaxi volcano in the central highlands of Ecuador. A chemical engineering student back at the University of Calgary, Danielle was not only intelligent, but fiercely athletic, and was a medal-winning member of her school's track and field team. Always one to chase adventure and challenge herself physically, Danielle joined a guided hiking group that began scaling the volcano on June 2nd, 2013. Shortly after this image was captured, a huge chunk of ice the size of a car fell from the top of the volcano. It struck Danielle as the group made their descent. She was killed on impact. Next, we have these before and after shots of Evgeny Stepanovich Kobitev an artist, writer, and teacher from Russia's Altai region. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, Evgeny joined the Red Army to fight for his motherland. A chilling prospect, given the enormous losses that the Russian forces were suffering. Still, he saw it as his duty. Just three months into his service, however, he was wounded and taken prisoner by the German forces. Evgeny was sent to the infamous Coral Pit, where few who were sent survived. The camp was essentially just a quarry with a few buildings scattered around, buildings which few of the inmates were allowed to enter for warmth. Most were left to survive in the elements, though there was little actual surviving going on. 90,000 POWs and civilians perished inside Coral's gates in the few years that the camp was active. As one other well-known inmate, Danilo Schmuck, put it, Coral was Quote, a pit of death with prisoners dying like flies from hunger, exposure, and epidemics. Evgeny was able to distract himself from his living nightmare by creating these haunting drawings depicting his time at Corolle. When the guards learned of his artistic talent, they began making him draw portraits of them as well. They rewarded him for his work with low-quality food. It wasn't much, 
scraps really, but it was enough to keep him alive while most others around him perished. In 1943, Evgeny made a daring escape from Korol and rejoined the Red Army once again. He fought until the end of the war in 1945 and helped to liberate others who had suffered in German camps along the way. Still, the Soviet High Command refused to award Evgeny the Victory Over Germany Medal for his service, due to the fact that he had allowed himself to be captured back in 1941. These before and after shots say it all really. The story of Evgeny's fight for survival is written all over his gaunt and wrinkled face. A young man who aged a lifetime in just a few short years. And that vacant stare. One can only imagine the horrors that those eyes saw during that time. Horrors that troubled him for the rest of his days. He may have survived, but his innocence most certainly didn't. For the rest of his life, Evgeny was haunted by nightmares, but found solace within his art. He died on January 29th, 1973. On the night of August 31st, 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, and her companion, Dodi Alfayed, departed in a limousine from the Hotel Ritz, Paris, along with their bodyguard, Trevor Rhys Jones, and their driver, Henri Paul. Since Princess Diana was such a high-profile figure in the world, she and Dodi were being hounded by paparazzi, and as they left the hotel, they were pursued by dozens of them. In an effort to escape them, Henri Paul entered Paris's Postelmar Tunnel, going at about 65 miles per hour. But what nobody realised was that Mr. Paul had been drinking, and was feeling the effects of both the alcohol and the prescription medication he was on at the time. His reaction time and ability to control the vehicle had both been severely impaired, and those factors, combined with the speed of the vehicle and the flashes of the cameras, resulted in disaster. This is perhaps the final photo taken of Diana's vehicle before it crashed inside the tunnel, taken by a paparazzo who had chased them down and overtaken them. The picture shows a clearly startled Henri Paul behind the wheel, dazed by the flash of cameras, the wildness of the situation, and the cocktail of substances in his system. In the passenger seat sits bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones. In the rear, we can see the back of Princess Diana's head as she looks out to see if they were still being pursued. Dodie sat beside her. Seconds later, Mr. Paul lost control of the limo and swerved into a pillar. Dodie Alfayed and Henri Paul died on impact. Princess Diana passed away shortly after. Trevor Reese Jones was the only survivor and needed facial reconstruction surgery due to the severity of his injuries. Although the photo does show Diana mere moments before the crash, this actually wasn't the final photo of her taken alive. As she breathed her final breaths, the paparazzi continued to snap photo after photo of her before the emergency services arrived. None of those photos have ever been publicly released, but they likely do still exist somewhere, in somebody's private collection. In August of 1992, Ruby Ridge, Idaho was the setting of an 11-day siege and shootout that resulted in the loss of three lives. Those of US Marshal Bill Deegan, 14-year-old Sammy Weaver, and Sammy's mother, Vicki Weaver, shown here cradling her 10-month-old baby moments before her demise. Her husband, Randy Weaver, had failed to appear in court on firearms charges, and he, his family and a close friend had fled to a cabin in Ruby Ridge to lay low. The property was surrounded by law enforcement on August 21st, who, at the time, kept a low profile. However, that same day, they had a run-in with the Weaver son, Sammy, and Randy's friend, Kevin Harris. During this encounter, Sammy was shot in the back by a marshal, and Kevin killed Marshal Deegan. From there, a green light was given to take out any of the adult family members if the opportunity presented itself. After that incident, the rest of the Weaver family went to reclaim Sammy's body and placed it inside a cabin adjacent to the one they were holding out in. 
From there, they all agreed not to surrender. The following day, as Randy, his daughter Sarah, and his friend Kevin went to visit Sammy's body, an FBI sniper opened bar on them, striking Randy in the back. They all ran back to the cabin to take cover. The sniper fired a second shot as the group scrambled inside, striking Kevin Harris in the chest. Vicky, who was still holding her baby at the time, happened to be standing just behind the door. The bullet exited Kevin and fatally struck Vicky, narrowly missing the ten-month-old in her arms. Vicky and her family were by no means saints and held some very horrible opinions, but this shot was undeniably reckless given that the marshals had taken this photo just moments prior and knew of the baby's presence. After this incident, Randy Weaver was arrested. The only thing he was found guilty of was missing his original court date, for which he served 16 months behind bars. He and his surviving relatives, in turn, filed a wrongful death suit for $200 million related to the killing of his son and wife. The matter was settled out of court. Randy was awarded $100,000, and his three daughters, one million each. Thank you very much for listening. Before this video ends, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon especially my biggest supporters. Punished Kratos, Hamish K, Nephus 1988, Lydia Glassley, That One Guy Thomas, Nadine, Jesse Jug, Alex Greensall, Alicia Jaggles, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Beatrice Matarazzo, Charlie Lackey, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lotham, Craig Polliner, Crawford K. McDonald, Expand Dong, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Joshua Quintero, Larry Mattingly, Leonardo Martinez, M. May H., Mackenzie Griffin, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logdurech, Philip Wester, Procupidine Natter, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Mrs. Avon Rankin, the Deck of Cards, and TNS Mum. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It really helps the channel out. Be sure to smash that like button, or I'll smash you. And you'll all be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.